Please welcome one of the finest groups of elected leaders in the nation, Speaker of the House, Jace Bolger, Senate Majority Leader, Randy Richardville, Attorney General, Bill Schuette, Secretary of State, Ruth Johnson, and Lieutenant Governor, Brian Kelly. Our moderator for this evening's panel is Rick Elbin, Wood TV 8 Grand Rapids. Well, good evening, everybody, and get ready for some fun because up here you have some folks that aren't afraid to answer your questions, so don't be afraid to send them up. I have a few, but if you have cards, please feel free because I'd like to get as many in as we possibly can. Thank you all for coming back. As I mentioned earlier, two years ago we did this, and it's so rare that I ever get asked back anywhere. <laughs> so I, I am happy to do this. And again, I'm doing your questions, so if you want to send up some cards, please do. Let's, uh, I'm going to open, uh, as I just said, I'm going to ask your questions, but first I want to ask one of mine as we start this, because we're talking about leading, talking about where the state of Michigan is, and in just the two years since we were here on Mackinac, it's a considerably different state. And let me say, for the record, that unemployment just took an uptick. We just saw that in this last month's report. We know that Detroit still has some major challenges. How many of you drove up here How'd you like those roads? <laughs> so there are still some things that need some work. I'd like to get your take, and Mr. Speaker, I'll start at my far left and move back to you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, tell me about what you think the challenges. I know you'll have an opportunity to talk about what you see as successes, but tell me about challenges, if you can, in about 60 seconds or so. Oh, is that all? 60 seconds. All right. Give you uh, I think Michigan is a vastly improved state. We can talk about numbers all day. We can talk about over 200,000 jobs created. The unemployment figure varies depending on how many people are looking for work. Over 200,000 jobs created, but what I get excited about is seeing personal income rise, to see people's home values coming up. But you ask about challenges? We're not there yet. We've made significant progress. People's lives are getting better. Their opportunity, their, their future is brighter. But now is no time to let up. We don't have to wonder what the Democrat policies would lead us to. We saw those in the prior last lost decade. And so what the challenges are, the challenges are to continue to make those tough decisions, to solve those real problems, to make people's lives better. Because this really isn't about Republican versus Democrat. This is about Michigan's working families and how we best serve them and how we best make sure that they succeed here in our great state. Mr. Majority Leader. Hi, Rick. Uh I think it's pretty easy, really. The biggest challenge that we have in order to provide the kind of leadership necessary in the state of Michigan is to keep the Republican Party united. If you look back to the years when the first George Bush was president of the United States, there was a Ross Perot guy that came along. And at that point in time, the conservative vote was some 60% of the, of the country. However, it was split between two candidates, and that ushered in the era of Bill Clinton. We still have a Hillary Clinton hanging around. The only leadership that's really happening in this country is happening here in the state of Michigan. The rest of the states are looking to Michigan as an example, and that's because of Republican leadership. Every major office in the state of Michigan is held by a Republican. The, the problem would be if that party got, got split. Mr. Attorney General. Uh, you know, I view it this way, and I appreciate and agree with what uh, Jason Randy talked about, but what the Republican Party needs to be, we need to be the problem-solving party of Michigan and America. Uh, federally, we need to deal with issues like immigration and energy, and in Michigan, we need to make sure that we continue to drive down taxes and keep the cost of business low, and we need to make sure we have a complete commitment to public safety, because there will never be a complete economic recovery in, uh, in the city of Detroit in, in the state of Michigan until we have a complete uh, commitment to public safety. So where capital goes to Detroit and where schools are safe and the streets are uh, secure, those issues I think are so fundamentally important for Michigan's future and our Republican Party needs to make sure we, we solve those. And I agree, there is no turning back. When we come to these elections in 2014, there'll be the turn back the clock crowd who want to go back to the old days of more government, more taxes, more regulations, more rules. We're not going back. The Michigan Republican Party in our state is going forward. That's the way we need to lead. Matt. 
Madam Secretary. As Secretary of State, I think there's two issues that we, you can never work hard enough and long enough on. One is better customer service. We've done many things already, including expresssos.com, where you can go online and get almost everything you need. We have print and go now to make it more convenient for you. And then, of course, the other one that is near and dear to my heart, which is election integrity. We started a safe initiative, Secure and Fair Elections. We have many more people now that have to disclose. We have disclosure available for people in the local communities, so you'll know, you will even be able to tell from the convenience of your home or office who's giving money to school board members, township officials, city officials. I think that kind of disclosure is so very, very important. I also think that our first time ever election audits is so important to make sure that we have absolute integrity in every election. And then the other thing is cleaning up the qualified voter file. We know that Michigan at one time, according to the Pew Center on the States, had 102.54% of the eligible electorate registered to vote in Michigan just doesn't add up. So we've taken the bull by the horns, we've given it lots of elbow grease, and we've taken off people that have died through the Social Security Administration records. We've also tried to take off our non-citizens who were encouraged to register to vote for 34 years, and we also are making sure that you only vote once. Mr. Lieutenant Governor. Well, I'm so proud of the work that, uh, that these guys have done, and what a, what a team, what an honor it's been to, to work with you. Now, I remember when I was first elected in the State House of Representatives, it was 2007. That was the year of the infamous government shutdown, a very embarrassing time in Michigan's history. I remember one night I was laying down to go to sleep under my desk during a call of the house where they, they lock the doors and everybody has to, has to wait inside till leadership decides to let you vote on something. And uh, I took my tie off, and uh, that was back before Rick Snyder when we wore ties. And uh, <laughs> so I, I laid down and I put it over my eyes as I, as I was going to go to sleep and I thought, and I thought this job was gonna be more glamorous than this. <laughs> and, but that was really the, the backdrop of, of, of how things were when I first started. And it was, a, it was a, a commitment that many of us made at that point to say, if we're ever in a position to, to move beyond this dysfunction and, and be decisive and stop putting off problems, this will never happen again. And so now, as, as we've been in that position, we're really tested in 2011 and 12, and 13, we're starting to see the results. We see all these, all these great trend lines that are turning around and moving in the right direction. The hardest part is maintaining discipline on a system that so desperately, the, the, the pull is to desperately take it back to the previous status quo, which was so bad for Michigan. You know, that, that thing that maybe people were comfortable with in the past, but we can't afford to go back to the old way. We have to be very diligent about jealously guarding the, uh, the, the fiscal discipline that we have in place to continue to pay down the debt, to continue to bend our cost curves down, to be more competitive all the time. You know, the Bureau of Health Services came in and we got this initiative to shorten the time it takes to get a permit and, uh, or a license. And, and we've cut 60% off the time it takes to get your license to practice in, in health fields. And it's like, that's great. Now what can we do to cut that in half? I mean, it's just always an attitude toward continuous improvement. We can never be complacent about where we're at because when you're standing still, you're falling behind. And as long as we keep that attitude, and, and, and the best way to keep that attitude is keep Republicans in, in charge, that, uh, that we are really going to accelerate this great trend that started. You, you mentioned attitude, and I want to I want to get a sense of the attitude. Each uh, of us have children that we would like to say stay in Michigan, and we know that by and large, over the past few decades, Republican and Democrats in charge, that hasn't happened because the opportunity has not always been in Michigan. So here's what I want to know. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Majority Leader. How has the business climate and landscape changed? in such a way, if Michigan wants to be a leader, to create jobs that will attract the, the kind of investment in this state 
that will keep all of our kids here where they can make a living and don't have to go to South Carolina or Texas or wherever else, what has been done and what still needs to be done to accomplish that? I'll start with you and we'll move this way again. Well, there's so much that I'm not going to try and, and, and do all of it, but when, when the speaker and the governor and I and the lieutenant governor sat down um, just, just under three years ago, we decided the first thing we needed to do was to bring integrity to the financial situation. In other words, the budget. We needed to balance our budget. Uh, we were $1.8 billion in the hole. Um, we had waited till September 30th to pass the budget in a couple of prior years, and so we wanted to get that under control. We also eliminated the Michigan business tax. What would you think of that? You know, um, That's all. We, we made Michigan a friendlier place to do business. Not just the numbers and not just the taxes and that kind of thing, but we welcomed people. And we were the only state in the United States to have negative population growth during the first year that uh, uh, Rick Snyder was, was governor. The only one. So we had all sorts of people moving away. Our unemployment rate was 14 point two percent number one in the country now it's eight point two percent Fitch rated us the second best state in the country coming out of the recession we started off at 50th less than three years ago Standard and Poor's Moody's have all upgraded our bond ratings we have done that by fiscally managing the budget we did not spend the 400 million dollars that we found in the revenue estimating conference in the first term we put 130 of it toward our quote unquote credit card debt, and we put 255 million in our rainy day fund, which was at $10 million. We had a dollar per person in our savings account for the state. Now we have 600 million. So first of all, you show the, the business community that you know how to run the state like a business. And by eliminating the business taxes, taking out some of the red tape, we could get into all the details of those things, but we have created during the last two and a half years, 200 50,000 new jobs in the state of Michigan. Mr. Attorney General. Well, you know, we have a, and I'm delighted to be here and with this outstanding Republican team, and I think one of the uh, really key things that we did in Michigan is that, you know, we are a right-to-work state. I'm a right-to-work Attorney General. That was terrific for the state of Michigan. That's what happened. And this, it's an incredibly uh, competitive global marketplace. Now we're positioning Michigan to grow in the future. And really, I got to tip my hat to the governor and the legislature uh, who you know, forced and, and made sure we are now a right to work state. The second issue we need to do is continue to drive down the cost of doing business so that Michigan is a place where capital will come, jobs will be created, so we have to make sure we always drive down the cost of business, and we need to make sure that we send a message out there that our cities are safe. We have you know, four cities in the state of Michigan where the uh, homicide rate is the top of the charts, and we need to make sure we have a safe environment so that young people and companies and schools are safe. So it's safe streets, safe schools, safe communities, drive down the cost of business, and boy, what a difference uh, Michigan as a right to work state is gonna make in the future. That's what I think. I, I wanna come back to that in a minute. Madam Secretary, what's been done? What needs to be done yet? Well, I just wanna take a moment to thank each of you that are here tonight and everyone else that wasn't able to come up for your hard work to put this great team in place. I have to tell you what you were able to accomplish by putting the right people in leadership. Our gross domestic product went from dead last in this nation in 2009. We're at sixth in growing. We saw over 70,000 people leaving this state because we do driver's license every year. For 10 years, we had a mass exodus of our brightest and our best. Guess what? Two years of growth. Last year marked the second year of job expansion in Michigan. Our motor, uh, our motor vehicle production increased 21% in 2011. Our income growth, we went from 42nd in this nation to 15th and growing. We're um, number one in the nation in terms of job creation potential and the availability of skilled labor. And our housing starts went up 
5%. So thank you for putting the right team at the right time in place in Michigan. Mr. Lieutenant Governor. It, it's really about opportunity when you, when you talk about keeping young people in our state. I mean, it's already the best place to be. I hear people talk about placemaking. We have every advantage in the world in terms of the place that is, in, that is Michigan. So it's, it's more about the opportunity. And if we can provide the opportunity in our state, the environment for growth, for job growth, to make a family, to make a career, to stay here, then our, our people are going to stay here. And it's, a heart, it's heartbreaking to me. Now, as, as you know, we have a little bit of friction sometimes in the office with the governor going to that other school when I went to Michigan State. And the, I, can, I can never think of the name of the other school. <coughs> the, um, but there are more Michigan State graduates working in Chicago than in our big city. And there, that, is no way to, that is no way to build a future. And so it's really, we really have to, to concentrate and focus on an environment for growth so that there's opportunity, whether it's an innovator trying to start up a business for the first time. And that's where cutting out all that red tape. You know, the film said we are a thousand less rules and regulations, but that was, that's a little out of date. You know, this is, this is actually the area where I spend most of my time. We have, uh, we have regulations that we work with the legislature to get repealed, but administrative rules as well that we can just admit, uh, eliminate on our own. And now it's 1,300 net, 1,300 fewer rules and regulations than when we started. And that really helps, particularly the small guys. Mr. Speaker, I want you to weigh in, but I just wanted to, to also uh, ask Lieutenant Governor, uh, even though he couldn't remember the name of that school, you must commend them on having excellent skywriting skills. They, uh... <laughs> that was cool. Yeah. Well, Rick, your question was about the business climate, so let me right. answer your question. but. You also frame it, I think, absolutely perfectly, and that's to talk about our kids. Uh, so when you talk about the business climate, we can focus on the $18 billion that Ford invests in Michigan a year and the 3,000 jobs that they're going to add to Michigan. They're announced uh, they're going to add here in Michigan. Uh, but we need to understand those are opportunities. We talk about we operate in a competitive environment. I'm very excited that two years later we live in a right-to-work state. Michigan should be the most free state in the country. And so is Governor Walker here yet? I don't know, he may not be in the room, but Governor Walker, uh, I, I would love to share a story that I, I celebrated a, a ribbon cutting in Battle Creek, Michigan, where Janesville Acoustics was adding 225 jobs to Battle Creek, Michigan. Janesville is owned by Jason Corporation in Wisconsin, and they chose Michigan to locate their business. So it's about where Michigan needs to be the most free state, the most friendly state, mm -hmm to operate a business, but because when you talk about jobs, when you, when you ask about business climate, we'll hear our colleagues across the aisle, we'll hear the Democrats talk about jobs, but what's that mean? If you wanna make Michigan a better place to find a job, you have to make Michigan a better place to provide a job. And when you talk about what this really means and what we're doing, this is about Michigan's workers. It's about the men and women who get up every day to go to work and provide for their family. And it is about our future. I have two teenagers a senior in high school and a sophomore in college. I hope grandkids are still a ways off. Uh, but when we do, when we are blessed with grandkids, I want them to live here in Michigan. And I understand the only way they'll get to do that is if they can grow their career here in Michigan. So we talk about business climate, we talk about the policies that we're changing, but what this is really about is it's the future for our kids <laughs> and the future for our kids here in Michigan. Yeah, you, you talk about a future. I'm <clears throat> thinking about how I'm going to live in retirement, so I want them to have a good job. Um, <laughs> I, I want to go back to something, uh, Mr. Attorney General, and anybody, we, I don't, we don't have to do this in any order. Um, and this is, this is my question. There, there is a question here about right to work, but I, help me out here. Two years ago, we walked off this stage, and I believed that there was no unanimity when it came to right to work. I'm not going to worry about who was where and what, why and all of that. And then, kind of like that night that we slept in the House chamber in 2007, there were some other nights and days, and we hung around, and the next thing I know, we've got a lame duck session, and the next thing I know, you had a bunch of visitors over at the Capitol, oh, and yeah. now you're right to work state. Yeah. What happened? We, what, yeah. I mean, in that period of time, from the time we left here, it's not that I don't know what happened. You know, but I, actually, I think there's a very good lesson here. I would say there wasn't unanimity. 
Uh, I would say that two years ago, as I sat here, I didn't believe we'd become a right-to-work state. I hoped we would, but I wasn't yet ready to believe we would. Uh, I would say, though, that we work together. And so to the Attorney General's point earlier, uh, we are a party of differences of opinion. To the Senate Majority Leader's uh, point earlier, but we come together. We have differences of opinion. We work through those differences of opinion, but we charge together to solve problems, solve problems that will help our citizens. And so while two years ago we may not have thought we'd be a right-to-work state, we all talked about it. We spent a lot of time meeting about it, and we decided it was right for Michigan's workers to free them to make the choice of which organizations they want to, choose, they want to belong to. And see, I think Jason, Jason makes a great point because it really is about teamwork and leadership and an approach, and whether it's the governor, lieutenant governor, uh, Ruth's job, my job, and, and the, the responsibilities that Randy and Jace have, what happened in, in the ensuing days, weeks, months is people came together and said, okay, what's the legal framework? What's the language we wanna have? Um, how we wanna put it together? And how do we make sure we, we drive it home? And um, we did. And so Michigan's gonna be a better place because of that. Madam Secretary, here's one that's just for you. And I ask this because I'm gonna bet a day doesn't go by that somebody doesn't ask you about this. What are you doing to shorten the lines at the SOS branch? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good question, and it's very important to us. Customer services, number one. We, like everybody else at the state and government, had to tighten our belts. We have 25% less staff than we did 10 years ago. I know we have to live within our budget, so we have to be creative and look at ways that we can do a better job at providing services to the people of the state of Michigan. We started a new computer system called ExpressSOS.com, and I would really appreciate it if you checked it out. You can print and go your receipt, and we'll get you a tab within about a week. You can get your driver's license on the fourth year. On the eighth, we want a new picture and uh, a test, but on the fourth year, you can go online and get that. You can get a lost driver's license, a lost state ID. You can get your boat license tab. You can get so many things online, and that is shortening our lines. You don't have to drive, park, walk, wait in line anymore. Go on expresssos.com, and please, if you can, you also shorten the lines for people that have to come in, and we'll continue to look at more and more ways. We've also partnered with, the, um, uh, with Meyer in two locations where we have self-service stations. We've put self-service stations in our branch offices in our lobbies. We're working to see how we can work with the private sector and privatize as much as we can. A lot of people don't have internet service at their home. We started Express SOS Connect at your library. You can go to your library and whatever the cost is to carry that receipt with you, which is usually a dime to a quarter, you can get Whenever they're open, if you don't have a computer at your home, you can get what you need so you don't have to wait in line. So please go on expresssos.com and uh, save your time and don't wait in line. That's the first time she's ever been asked that question, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me ask something that just popped into my mind when you were talking about that. I, at the beginning of Governor Snyder's term, there were a lot of things he talked about. He went through the list that was on one of his push cards during the campaign, but I, I remember we had a conversation at one time about putting the state budget online. So it would be a database that you could search and you could, could see it would be at your fingertips. I appreciate it. it's a big document, lots of stuff to it. Uh, and when you were talking about all of the advances that you've made the Secretary of State's office, and this might be a better question for Mr. Nixon, but I know that you are a computer guy too. Uh, are we any closer to that? I should say, first of all, that it's, it's, you know, being 20 years younger than the governor, it's still, it's a little bit awkward that he gives me tech advice <laughs> on things. Um, and so, uh, so I, I don't, you know, in, in a lot of contexts, you'd consider me a computer guy, but not in our administration. The, um, and this is, uh, this ended up being a, a particularly tough challenge because of the legacy computer systems that the state has. Uh, they, they oftentimes people talk about it like uh, they'll say it like it's a joke um, that uh, if you if you know cobalt, then uh, we've got a place for you at the state of Michigan. 
And everybody's laughing except for me because I don't even know what cobalt is. <laughs> right? I think that was before my time. But, the, uh, but, the, but that's really the, the challenge is that we've got all these siloed systems and putting them all in together, even though you can get <coughs> information in terms of putting the budget online and so forth, that the, um, that the, the ease or the searchability of it uh, so that citizens could actually do something with the information is particularly challenging because of the technology, the way that technology has fallen behind over time. And so as we launched this good government effort, which is, which is about accountability and, um, and measurements and changing the way that the state does business and improving processes, a big part of that are the technology improvements. And so the Department of Technology Management and Budget with uh, Director Nixon um, have several ongoing projects to improve the uh, the, the technology so that we can do the innovative things that, uh, that we think our, our citizens deserve. And so we can look at great examples like what Ruth has done in the Secretary of State's office. And it's nice with the exception of when I have to have an eye exam uh, or prove that I, you know, my eye sight is still at a certain level, I don't even have to go in. And those are the sorts of things we are putting more and more of these processes online so that when it, whether it's permits, or uh, licenses and so forth, that you just go online and you get it done there where you never actually have to deal with anybody in the government. That saves us time and money, taxpayer time and money, and it's better customer service for our people. The name of this panel is called Michigan Leading the Nation, and obviously you all come at this from a couple of different perspectives. One as elected officials and people who have a job to do. The other as partisan Republicans. I come at this as a reporter who is interested not in the partisanship, but in the performance. I was reminded last week when we were visited in Grand Rapids by a guy some of you may remember, uh, a guy named John Engler came to town. And uh, Governor Engler is now uh, an advisory member, actually the chairman of an advisory board, for a group of investors who primarily are focused on investing in Michigan-grown companies. Companies that were started perhaps a generation and a half ago, and maybe that next generation doesn't want to take up the mantle of that company, or perhaps they want to keep the company intact, but they need financing or, or that kind of thing. And they went through the numbers. I won't try to quote them here, because uh, I would certainly get them wrong. But I was impressed and reminded how many Michigan-centric companies that we have here, many of those involved in manufacturing, which some of us would have said four years ago or seven years ago might be dead but that would have been premature because we certainly have seen growth in some of those manufacturing areas and all of that is a long way to get to this. And I'll start with you, Mr. Lieutenant Governor. You guys can have a free for all on this. What do we do to, and, and I know we talked about good business and we talked about regulation and those kind of things, but because we have that entrepreneurial spirit in the state of Michigan, because we already have companies that are here and as many of you have pointed out, and even some of the folks on the other side of the aisle have pointed out it's easier to expand what you have than it is to go out and beg other people to get here. How are we doing there? How are we doing with retaining, I mean, we all know the big names, but there are a whole lot of little names that you don't know unless you're a state representative and you travel around and you meet the folks and you know that Jim's Widget Shop employs 12 people that makes a big difference in your individual town because all of those people have good jobs, maybe even health care. So I, what are we doing for those kind of businesses to retain and to help create new ones? It's a great question, Rick, because really Michigan and what we're built on is innovation. So we, we know some of the big examples like cars, but let me just give you a couple of other examples off the top of my head. Did you know invented in Michigan? Scrubbing bubbles, right? Talk about a quality of life improvement. Scrubbing bubbles, love scrubbing bubbles. Saran wrap, Ziploc baggies, kitty litter, I mean, these are Michigan inventions that really changed so much. And, and, and they were small ideas or that turned into big ideas that turned into big companies. For so long, we were out there trying to convince somebody from somewhere else in the world to come into Michigan and save us. And after 15 years of that strategy, it was safe to say that that was a spectacular failure. That where we should have been focusing the whole time is how to create an environment for success around the ones that were already here. We don't have to bribe them to be here. They're already part of our, our communities, already part of our success, already dedicated to what's happening 
here in Michigan. And that's why we went after, instead of offering more tax credits, to say, let's just do away with the bad tax system in the first place and say, no matter what you want to do, no matter whether you're a small company or a big company, a new technology, an old technology, whatever you want to do with your life, that Michigan is going to be the best possible place to do it. And that's why we're reducing and eliminating the, the regulations and focusing in on creating a talent pool to where uh, the, when these ideas can be deployed in Michigan because we've got the right We've got people with the right skills in order to do a, a wide array of things. And so that's really what it's about, is creating that environment for growth around the ones that are already here. That's our best job growth potential. That's where our job growth has been in the past and that's where it's going in the future. Anybody else? I, well, <clears throat> I skipped the last one, so I think it's my turn. But I was distracted Did you by just a, pull Senate rank? Is that what, no, 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 we're, okay. we're the same kind of. I'm sorry. I was, <laughs> I was distracted by a beautiful woman in the audience. Oh, that's my mother right there in the light blue. Wow. Stand up. Stand up. It's nice Thank to you, Linda. And you wonder how he keeps getting reelected, right? <laughs> because of her. Everybody knows that. <laughs> it is because it's of true, isn't it? Your mom. Yeah. Well, one thing that we have to do as Republicans is we have to tell our story better. Rick Snyder has a relatively low approval rating for a guy that's probably accomplished more in the United States in the last two and a half years than any other governor out there. We're not telling the story well enough. We need to work on that. We need to appeal to people that's not in the base, that are not in the base sometimes. We need to understand and empathize with the people that are out there and create, I mean, I'm gonna get that back to the answer to your question, but I just wanna be clear. We have to communicate better the story. We are defensive as Republicans. We take it, you know, they come after us and we just do nothing but block the punches. We need to start telling people that we're leading this state, and we're leading the state ahead of the rest of the country because of Republican leadership. We need to start telling that story better. One of the things that's happening, and by the way, Bobby Shostak is doing a great job of leading this party. Oh yeah, Bobby. Now, I, I agree with everything that Brian said, but I want to add a little bit something different. We have a uniqueness in Michigan that nobody else has any place else in the world. It's because of the auto industry. We have three major research universities, Wayne State, Michigan State, and the University of Michigan. What makes us different than MIT or UCLA or any of the other big research type companies is we not only come up with the, the great ideas, we also know that eventually we have to manufacture and make them. And because of our history with the auto industry, we have that partnership between academia and manufacturing better than any place else in the world. We need to tell people that story. We have some great stories right here in Michigan. Shinola is one of my favorite ones, a new watch company in Detroit. And it's at the, creative, the Center for Creative Studies in Detroit, where we're, we're promoting design, we're pr promoting creative thinking. Um, in addition to the research universities, um, I want you to write this down. And let me see if I can read it, because I'm pretty sure I'm the only grandparent up here, aren't I? Is that right? I, so I want my grandkids to move back to Michigan, you know? There's a, uh, check this out on the internet. It's called Low Campbell Ewald. It's a public relations marketing company. And they talk about the city of Detroit and the rest of the world looks at Michigan, they think of Detroit first. If you think we can just abandon Detroit, you're wrong. Detroit is the best opportunity for any new company in the country, maybe in the world, because we've got the low property values, they're going through bankruptcy, they're redoing their tax structure, and we get to define what the future of Detroit is. Look up this four minute video that talks about Detroit and why these young people and these young companies are saying, the best place to come in the world is Detroit, and they'll explain a little bit why. Well, uh, Rick, please, Mr. Speaker, jump in on that, but I also want to have you tag on one more thing. Do you share the optimism that I've heard expressed by the Senate Majority Leader? The governor uh, told me in an interview, uh, a bit to my surprise, a few weeks ago, that he thought that Detroit might be one of, property in Detroit might be one of the best values on the globe if you can get police and fire and the basic services restored to the point where your property is safe, mm -hmm. 
which is obviously important. Do you share that optimism? Well, you, you mentioned John Engler. Uh, I'll tell you one of my favorite phone calls I got uh, recently was from Governor Engler. As he said, you guys are really clear in the table, and it's great to see. And I said, well, thank you, Governor, because you set the table. And so it's ours to continue on, and ours to continue on from our successful history in Michigan to make sure that we reinvent our state. And what we can't lose sight of in Michigan is when you think of Ford or Kellogg or Dow, most people across the world think of companies. But we know in Michigan those are family names. Those are family names because really you, your question kind of begs the, the trap of what happens in politics in that uh, the Democrats will talk about what government program they want to do as though government bestows success. Then they will turn around and they will see success and they'll punish it. Well, the key to the success that you talk about, the success that we seek, and the success I believe is going to happen in Detroit and in the state of Michigan is one word, and that's freedom. It's freedom for our people to determine their destiny, freedom for our people to succeed. And when they are free to succeed, they will lead us to that success. And so it comes from the people of the state of Michigan, and that's where that success of our future is going to happen. Anybody else want to weigh in on this and or on your attitudes towards Detroit at this somewhat early hour, because there's a, still a long way to go when it comes to all the process that goes with bankruptcy that you would know about Mr. Attorney General probably better than most, having watched some of these things. Anybody got a thought on that? Well, I, you know, I, all of us in some way, shape, or form have a heritage that that runs through Detroit. I mean, so many of us in Michigan have that, whether it's, you know, in our current life, in our lifetime or in, in previous generations. And, uh, but, but regardless of, uh, of how close that connection that you currently have with it, I wanna know how many people in the audience, when you watch that film, and you guys saw that film right before this, right? So when it, when it showed the city of Detroit and, and, and made the bold statement about where we stand today and what the possibilities are, I mean, who got goosebumps? about that. I mean, that is a, I, I, we all want so badly for Detroit to, to, uh, to succeed, to do well. We want to think about Detroit here in Michigan the way they think about Boston and Massachusetts, or the way they think about Phoenix in Arizona, the way they think about uh, Atlanta and, and Georgia. I mean, the idea that this should be an economic engine that is driving success that the, that the rest of the state can benefit from, as opposed to something that overall is, is holding our numbers and our performance down. And so, that the, the way that we like to think about this is that, you know, the Detroit is not, the, the bankruptcy of Detroit, that the bankruptcy itself is not a problem. That's the solution for this, for this restart, for this reinvention. And so we know we have the right people that are in place. We know that we have a lot of excitement and uh, investment potential because it's already started in the city. What we need now are neighborhoods at work. So the, the business districts and midtown and downtown, that there's all kinds of reasons to be uh, optimistic about it because of the things that are already, already happening today and have happened in the last several years. But what we need are safe neighborhoods. And that's when it comes down to the day-to-day the -day management. And when we have uh, folks in place like Kevin Orr, which is the right person to lead this, uh, this effort and the accountability that is put into the entire system, we know that uh, the Detroit has that future. So I am bullish on, on Detroit in terms of an investment, but just generally speaking about the, the future and the potential and the possibility when you consider uh, where, where we are starting today, as difficult as that is, uh, that, that, that that future is bright. I, let quickly, me just, Rick, let me just sure, give a, a, another ta you know, take on optimism, and I'm an optimist by, by nature. Um, in Detroit, uh, my office as Attorney General, where uh, part of my job is to be a voice for the Constitution. So I'm, um, I'm a voice for the Constitution with all these issues in Detroit. And one thing I'm very optimistic about is, in terms of you talked about our state and where we're going, in October, next month, um, I and, and our team will be before the United States Supreme Court uh, defending uh, Michigan's Constitution. I'm a voice for the Constitution. That's part of my job as, as Attorney General. And I'll be uh, taking Michigan's Constitution, defending it. That's the Michigan Civil Rights Initiative that says there can be an entrance to outstanding universities. It needs to be done on merit, talent, ability, equality. And I'm going to take... I'm going to thank you. I'm going to defend our Constitution before the United States Supreme Court. And what that does is really sends a message to America that we're on the cutting edge of where 
uh, education and admission needs to be. And I think our Republican Party, and with respect to uh, uh, Detroit and urban areas, the Republican Party needs to be the party uh, of education emancipation. We need to make sure that we are the most creative state in terms of giving parents choices where they send their kids to school. If you look at what the illiteracy rates are in, in urban areas across the country, whether it's LA, New York, Detroit, they're over 40%. Illiteracy meaning that you can't read, and that means you can't fill out a job application. It means you can't you know, go, go online and, and look for a job. We need to make sure that we're the most creative state in terms of giving people, and particularly in urban areas, the opportunity, uh, as Reagan would say, you know, that this land uh, that's situated between two great oceans and you give people hope and opportunity. If you can't spell opportunity, if you can't uh, read what the directions are to this America, which is an opportunity place of ambitions and hopes and dreams, you'll never get there. So we need to make sure that we drive education change in our state like no other state in America. I would have I should have done this earlier, but quickly, with a show of hands, how many of you feel a direct Detroit, not, you don't have to live there, but feel like you have a direct connection to the city of Detroit? My in-laws are, are from the area, I spend a lot of time in there. How many of you are as or more optimistic about the future of Detroit than our panel? Look at that video then, because, you know, <laughs> you know Rick, really good. I would say you don't have to take our word for it. There are people with at least a little bit more money and certainly a whole lot more smarts who are betting on Detroit. You're watching them invest. They are buying uh, into Detroit and they are investing in the state of Michigan. So I, I'd say don't take our word for it. Watch what's happening in Detroit. And they are betting big. All right. A couple of you are going to be participating, I suspect, in the next election cycle, but not for the current offices that you hold. The rest of you, I make the assumption, will endeavor to do that. We got about 60 seconds per person left because you are all that stands between them and dinner. <laughs> so, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, I'm going to, and the task is the same for all of you. I want you to talk for 60 seconds about something positive about the state of Michigan, about why you think Michigan is leading, and don't use the word Republican. <clears throat> So the, the state of Michigan has completely changed the, the, uh, the playing field that our people have to work on. We're not trying to dictate where people go in their lives, but instead say no matter what you want to do, this is going to be the best possible place to do it. And we've done that through implementation of, of conservative policies, and we look toward the future. It's never about what makes it easiest in, in day one or year one or even year five that we're talking about the things that are the right decisions for the next generation. And that's really what this is all about, creating a, a Michigan where we keep that promise that was made right back in the very, very beginning, where every single generation left in America and here in our state left a state that was stronger than they themselves inherited. More opportunity, more security, more prosperity, and yet, we here in Michigan and our nation certainly as a whole are standing on the verge of breaking that promise for the first time. Where, where our, our kids and our grandkids won't have as good of opportunity, as much security, as much prosperity as what we ourselves had. We're rewriting that, uh, we're rewriting that here in Michigan. That we're, we don't want to accept that that promise has to be broken, but instead be an example for the rest of the nation. It is possible to reduce government, to reduce spending and reduce debt. It is possible to be more um, uh, customer service friendly. It's possible to have less regulation than you used to have. It's possible to really trust people with their own destinies, and that's what we're about. Madam Secretary, a little less than 60 seconds. <laughs> Michigan is a comeback state. We're just full of fight and fate, and it's moving us in the right direction. And I can't tell you how excited I am about the prospects of Michigan and I have a 14-year-old daughter and I want it to be the best place for generations to come because this is my home, it's been home for generations. And I look at even my own family, my grandmother and grandfather, he had a stroke very young, he was a fireman and a policeman and she sold penny candy to raise her three kids and then she cleaned bathrooms and then she got a great job cleaning bathrooms at Chrysler. And my father never graduated from high school, he's an immigrant. But you know what? 
What a great country. What a great state. If you sacrifice, if you work hard, and when you get knocked down, you get up and go again, it will work. You will be successful. That's what Michiganians have always done. Where that's what Michiganians will always do. Mr. Attorney General. And Rick, thanks very much for uh, hosting uh, us, and it's great to be with uh, uh, my friends here. Um, here's what I feel good about. You know, part of my job is also to be a voice for victims in the state of Michigan. And if you're a, a victim of human trafficking, uh, a young woman, uh, in essence, forced into human bond bondage, into forced employment, or worse yet, prostitution, we now have a human trafficking committee <coughs> that is going to design an approach to make sure we toughen laws, and there is a, a voice for victims of human trafficking today in Michigan, and we're leading the nation. And if you're a victim of the fungal meningitis, uh, that where Michigan's the epicenter, where we had 19 people die and 260 people infected by this bad medicine from Massachusetts. Now we're get, we have a grand jury and panel to uh, provide truth and justice. And so if you're a victim of uh, fungal meningitis uh, uh, illness, there's a, our justice system is going to find truth, and I think that means closure and healing for victims of, uh, across the state of Michigan. Senator? I'm more confident in Michigan state government today than I have been in the previous 15 years I've been here. I'm not a believer that government is bad. I believe that government is good when it's small, when it's efficient, and it, when it gets out of the way of its people. We have the best natural resources in the country, you can't argue that, and we have great people, great cities. What the government has to do, and what I think we've done a good job of, is enabling the citizens to grow and become what they want. We have young people coming back. The ones that used to leave are coming back. Our population is starting to increase for the first time in about a decade. If the government stays out of people's way and understands that all we need to do is enable them, the people of the great state of Michigan, the soccer moms, the people that are raising families, the people that are making lunches in the morning, we let them live the life that they want to live, we'll be a great Michigan again. Mr. Speaker? I'll tell you what motivates me. I remember too well the fear and the despair that was the destruction of the Grand Home Shower era. And I don't want it to happen again. I believe in tomorrow, in Michigan's future. I believe that my kids have the opportunity here in Michigan. I know that we're improving, but I also know too many people are still struggling. So I won't let up. I'll, Molly, my wife Molly and I are gonna get up every day and make sure that we retain a House majority and we're going to make sure that we vote for Governor Rick Snyder and Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly and the rest of this team. And we're going to make sure that our kids then have grandkids, and those kids and grandkids are here in our state succeeding and flourishing because of their hard work, because when they put it on in an honest day's work, they can get ahead in our great state. I want to thank the Michigan State Republican Party for inviting me to be part of this. It's always exciting to be able to talk to our elected officials, Mr. Speaker, Senate Majority Leader, Mr. Attorney General, Madam Secretary, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for your cooperation. Right. Thank you all, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks.